Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Anthony Canino. I'm from uh, State New University of New, New York, Binghamton University. I'm going to talk about my work on uh, proactive and adaptive energy aware programming with mixed type checking. Right, so, energy efficiency is an important problem for computer systems right, that has effect on operational costs, usability, safety, reliability and energy management techniques for these computer systems that exist for across the entire uh, software and hardware stack. Um, we focus on uh, techniques at the language level, which we broadly categorize as energy-aware programming. And um, for one method for uh, uh, energy-aware programming is the idea of having uh, multiple copies of a program or um, alternative versions of the program. Um, that all do the same thing functionally, but might um, have different levels of quality of service to save or consume energy. All right, so, for example, take a program uh, here that essentially goes through and just renders some scene. Right? So here we have some renderer with a refined parameter that affects how much refinement or post-processing is looped over and done on the scene after uh, it is initially rendered. Some kind of lighting model that has... Um, some light points or light sources internal to it that affect the way uh, light is, is, um, is projected across the scene and of course the scene and then we get this image here. Now we could have a similar program where we have a sl smaller level of refinement and less light sources and if you can see the image is actually slightly more blurry or jagged than this one that's over here. Right. And so we want to provide the programmer uh, tools and abstractions to do this kind of alternative programming. Right? And that's exactly what we do. Um, we've developed this new language called ENT that encourages uh, proactive programming on the part of the programmer, but also allows for adaptive or runtime decisions to be made. And kind of the centerpiece to this language is a um, type system with mixed typing um, that I will get into some of the details later on. And we have evaluated our system on three different platforms, um, Intel, Pi, and Android. And we've done some case studies um, that show our language enables this idea of both battery aware and temperature aware programming. So first, let's focus on the abstractions for um, this energy aware programming. Right? So in general, we, if we return to our example from before, um, when we have these uh, alternative copies of a program, um, we want to allow or enforce some kind of consistent communication across these program components. And what does that actually mean? Well, we're fine with this high energy renderer speaking to this high energy model and getting the scene here. And when we want to cons uh, conserve energy, we have this uh, lower energy renderer speaking to this lower energy model and um, everything's fine there. Now the issue is when a message is sent that crosses this kind of boundary. So we're assuming that we're sending a reflect message that does the lightening of the scene. And we want to prevent something that's supposed to be saving energy from accidentally transferring control into something that's going to consume more energy. And the way to do this is with types. And that's exactly the model that um, energy types from uh, Uppsala 2012 does. So if we look at, we have a relatively simple version of the renderer uh, that I've kind of discussed here. Um, some scene gets reflected, and based on some post-processing, we go through and refine it. So here we might declare something called mode types. So we say that the saver mode um, operates at, you know, is intended to consume less energy than one of full. And when we know the renderer is expensive, we label it with the full mode, and it's safe to then send a model of the full mode there. The case where we know the renderer is less expensive and meant to save energy is the saver there, and this will flag a type error when we try to send a message to a model with the full mode. Now, the grand question is how to capture uh, objects or program components with dynamic behavior. Right? Energy types is a purely static-based type system that uh, requires the programmer to form a specification of the way these energy objects are supposed to interact and define it ahead of time uh, with annotations and type inference. So some scenarios where that gets to be a little bit challenging is this idea of objects that need this runtime information before you can figure out what its energy behavior is. For example, if we return to this, uh, this model class, its energy behavior really depends on the lights and the number of lights that are in the scene, that are in the model, I'm sorry. And that information may come from some kind of uh, XML file that we don't know or we don't read until runtime. And we may know these files up front, but, even, but a lot of the times we may not. We may have no idea. And so this kind of configuration dependence is something that's hard to type with modes statically. 
Another example um, is when objects need to get the mode type based on contextual system information. For example, if we have a full battery, we may want to have a battery monitor that's operating at the full mode. And if we have less, we might have to have one that's operating at the saver mode. Right, so this kind of system contextual dependence is another example of something that's harder to type statically. Well, that's what our language ENT does, where ENT is just this kind of mixed uh, creature um, from Lord of the Rings. And, well, this mixed thing is really part of our static and dynamic systems. So first, well, let's look at this. We know that this uh, lighting model um, already has dynamic behavior. So the point comes to how do we specify its dynamic energy behavior? Well, that's what this abstraction called at an attributor, or we say attribution is. So at runtime, we can inspect this object, which I'll get into in a second, and kind of inspect its internals to see the state or what its energy behavior, energy mode is, right? So if we have a large number of lights, we're gonna say this is going to require a lot of energy. And if it has a low number, we're going to say that it requires less energy, or it's the full and the saver modes. And so we label that object with a dynamic mode type here. Now, before we can use a an object with a dynamic mode type, because in a sense, this dynamic type says its mode or type is in flux, we need to first snapshot it. And the way snapshot works is it takes um, one uh, parameter is some kind an object with a dynamic type and bounds on what the programmer expects that uh, object's attributor to resolve to. And so let's assume that this object was created and the amount of lights is actually three. When we snapshot this uh, DM, we're going to get the saver mode returned full because the snapshot will query the attributor and everything's okay. We can then use S here. Right? If, however, we get the full mode because this was actually larger than the programmer intended, we get a runtime type error that we call an energy ex exception. Right? And now this uh, runtime type error, this energy exception is um, a violation of the programmer's intended energy specification of the way their objects behave. And some solutions that we kind of take this, um, we take, by making this a type error, we kind of make explicit when this uh, specification is violated. And one of the approaches is, well, then continue to kind of debug and discover why this happened and, and maybe encode further constraints in the system. Another is, well, if we're operating at a, uh, essentially a mode higher than we intended, will adjust some kind of quality of service settings and then continue execution. Now with the idea of having um, all this kind of mode-based programming comes the idea of having mode alternative uh, behavior based on objects that have a certain mode. And what do I mean by that is, well, we can define this abstraction here called a mode case, which is essentially a variant type that will project or eliminate based on some mode type. So here we're saying this post-processing if it's eliminated with the saver mode, we'll take the value 5. If eliminated with the full mode, we'll take the value 100. And now when we use this mode case as a field in an object, um, what happens is because we, we eliminate that mode case internally to that object based on whatever mode that object is instantiated with. Right, so for example, if we create a renderer with the saver mode, we will implicitly project PP with that mode here and we'll get a lower quality renderer. If we create one with the full mode, we will get uh, a higher quality renderer. Right? And so we can combine this uh, mode alternative behavior with this idea of this uh, dynamic mode attribution to get a very principled form of uh, mode alternative behavior that's uh, based on an object's mode type. Right? So if we have an attributor that uh, resolves based on some kind of battery level, um, then when we snapshot this object and the battery is high, we're going to project and get this high quality renderer. And if it's low, we're going to save energy and go with the lower quality renderer here. So now I'm going to dig into some of the um, intricacies of the type system about how we actually get these, um, these abstractions. So we know statically um, that we can annotate modes and kind of regulate their, their behavior and end up with this uh, well-structured energy aware program. We also know that we can dynamically categorize certain behavior and still check it just at runtime. Well, snapshot is the bridge in our uh, language that uh, bridges these two systems, right? And how does it do that? Well, the first thing is there's this idea of uh, type distinction. Because an object must first be snapshot before it can be used or essentially receive a message, 
internally, the object, um, you can view its mode type parameter here as a static mode type variable. And so we chose the syntax like this on purpose. So externally, this renderer can have a dynamic mode type, but internally, this X is going to be some kind of a concrete mode type. And then we can use that internally here. And what snapshot does is, well, it kind of bridges this gap. So we will snapshot this dynamic M and say it needs to be at a mode of saver or X, where X would be any resolved mode of this renderer. So essentially something that we can communicate to safely. And the mode type that we give this object, well, since we know that it's either going to resolve and continue execution at runtime, or it will be flagged with an error at that point on, from here we can view it as some kind of existential mode type, or some kind of type that is between the bounds of saver and X. And we achieve this because of all post snapshot objects are fixed copied objects of the original that have a mode that can no longer change. Right? And this, um, this kind of snapshotting arose because when you view snapshotted objects, uh, multiple versions of them, because an object's mode type is, uh, mode can essentially be in flux based on its attributor, you could have two different uh, values having two different types. Right? And so by doing this, we enforce this idea of this monotonic change from an object with an unknown uh, mode to one of a fixed mode. Okay? And in addition, since we have this kind of copy approach where we snapshot this object, all uh, runtime errors um, will only occur at the snapshotting time. Right? So this, any check that is, we need to send a message to an object of the dynamic mode type um, really just only happens when we need to snapshot that object. So some technical results we've built um, our language. Uh, we formalized it uh, based on top of a featherweight Java. It has an expressiveness uh, similar to system F sub. Um, it's proven sound. Some implementation details is that we support both class level polymorphism and method level polymorphism. Um, and particular one uh, feature is that we allow method overriding for this um, consistency check for communication. So for example, um, certain methods we know never really have a high energy consumption. Let's, for example, getters and setters. So the programmer can override those methods and say it's something that will never use a lot of energy. And then we can still communicate to objects that might require a lot of energy um, by defining specific uh, method level, uh, method level um, energy characterization. And also, um, Snapshotting is typically done on objects um, at fixed points where we know that their behavior um, can be in flux. And we, um, because it's typically done only once or twice for certain objects, we can um, actually lazily copy that object. And if it's never snapshot more than once, we just reuse the old copy, reuse the old object. Now, for the evaluation, we have evaluated our system on Intel. Uh, Raspberry Pi and Android and the energy measurements you're going to see are all real energy measurements if anyone has any questions about how I gathered them I'm happy to answer so here's the suite of applications that we use to evaluate to ent um, so there are several from Intel um, several from Pi and several from Android and for some we used uh, some are shared across them um, in the paper we have a lot of details about kind of quality of service settings and um, input sizes and everything. Please see that if you would like inform more information about these applications. Now, the first application I'm going to discuss is NewPipe, which is an Android app that uh, Android YouTube streaming app. So the program, uh, the user searches for some video which has some kind of size, and then we'll select some kind of quality, of, uh, some kind of stream quality to then view that video. And what you're seeing here with this blue bar shows the energy consumption consumed of executing some large video um, when the system had high battery and one when the system had low battery. And so what does this actually mean? Well, we use some kind of contextual object that was snapshot when the system had high battery and it returned the full mode. And when the system had low battery, it returned the saver mode. And because we returned the saver mode here, when we needed to communicate to an object, a video that was very large, we got an energy exception, right? And we surrounded that energy exception with the try-catch block and responded by scaling down some kind of quality of service, which was about 240p as opposed to 360p for the video resolution, and then continued running. 
And then for comparison purposes, we did runs where everything remained the same, except that we missed the energy exception. So we're simulating what happens when you don't have a type system like ENT in place. And we kind of view this difference here as the energy saved when the programmer figures out an energy specification, then encodes it into the type system using our programming language. Right. Another similar uh, setup is an app called Video for the Raspberry Pi that uses the uh, camera module. And here, um, what you're seeing is when uh, the quality of service setting that was adjusted for this specific app when an energy exception was thrown was a video resolution as opposed to stream resolution for new pipe. But what's kind of important about these two um, quality of service settings is that adjusting them does not adjust the actual runtime of the program. So what you're seeing, seeing in terms of energy savings here is actually power savings of the devices. Okay, so now to evaluate um, the idea of this mode alternative behavior combined with the dynamic mode type, adaptive mode attribution, um, well, we created essentially a um, energy aware or contextual, a battery aware contextual object um, that when there was a lot of battery return to full mode, right, if there was less return to saver mode, and we combined it with a mode case that's selected for some kind of quality of service setting um, that the rest of the pro, that we then um, operated under from that point on. And so in the case of Sunflow, it's essentially this example I've been using the whole time. When there was high battery, we projected to a high level of post-processing. When there's medium battery, we projected to a medium level, low to a low. And we used the full projection when battery was high as a baseline um, for what you see here is the low level projection, low quality of service, and medium level quality of service. Right? And what this shows is that these numbers are the percent uh, saved as, as opposed to running at the uh, full mode or the uh, high battery. And it just shows that with this kind of principled um, mode adaptation, you can get very good uh, mode alternative uh, behavior in terms of the actual energy consumed. Right. And lastly, uh, we did one more experiment based on temperature awareness, which we used a similar kind of object, but here, um, it just this contextual object um, inspects the temperature of the system. Right. So if the temperature was high, it would return full, and if it was low, um, it would return saver. I should say that's the temperature of the CPU, sorry. And we combined it with a mode case um, that would um, essentially project based on this temperature for the amount of time you should sleep between task units of a program to cool the CPU. Right? So if you look at the Java run, um, it's essentially just a normal run where, uh, of the program where it continues to climb in terms of the CPU temperature. And if you look at the end run, you'll see that it climbs to about 65, and then it'll, snap, it, it'll sleep based on um, a snapshot of this object at the task iteration. It'll climb back up again and then sleep, climb back up and then sleep. Okay. And we kind of just graph these two based on the, the, the points of the program where we snapshot. So you're really seeing a comparison of the overall uh, temperature profile. And then it just shows that um, with ENT, we can get this idea of a temperature-aware programming. Right. So for related work, um, we've taken a lot of inspiration from several areas. Um, for application-level uh, energy management, um, this idea of uh, mode alter uh, alternative program behaviors in the form of uh, dynamic or, uh, of knobs, which essentially are our mode cases. Mode-based energy management, um, again, is this kind of general idea that our system follows out of all these uh, pieces, energy types is the one that we take the most information from, is it's the type diversion. Type system for approximation, um, we bear similarities, but we feel that we really complement the work as it stands. Um, certain systems um, really are, uh, they're concerned essentially with non-interference, um, where we really focus more on just the, the way that objects should interact with respect to energy. Of course, with the hybrid and gradual typing, there's a whole host of systems out there. Um, the biggest difference with us is that for our, our uh, dynamic types, our dynamic modes, essentially those modes um, are unknown at any point in time. So um, for other systems, typically uh, the type may not be known at runtime, but its type is, rel is fixed. Or for us, um, because of things like system information, it could be changing. And we, uh, for, for information flow systems, um, we also have certain similarities, but again, defer in that we're focusing much more on the energy consumption of objects. And 
So we've talked about uh, the uh, types for energy management and consistent communication of objects with respect to energy, um, these new abstractions, attribution and snapshotting, um, objects that uh, how, how we mix these two uh, disciplines, this uh, static and dynamic typing, and I've showed how we evaluated our system for battery and temperature aware programming. And with that, I will take questions. So, is there a sort of granularity question with when you should snapshot, when you should effectively do dynamic checks? That obviously I wouldn't want to snapshot every time I add two integers because now I'm going to spend more energy checking. Is it sufficiently inexpensive that it's sort of for any real problem it's irrelevant? Or is there ever a situation you would have to, to think about that? No, I, I wouldn't, um, sorry, I wouldn't snapshot um, every time you need to add two integers, right? Mm -hmm. But then again, in integers, energy behavior isn't exactly something that would be in flux, right? So you really want to abstract to the level um, that something really has this uh, uh, idea of its energy behavior just being something you don't know until runtime, right? And um, I think, especially from our program, uh, yeah, something like a renderer, a contextual renderer is a good example. Yeah. Yeah. So, point that uh, your expressive power uh, could be compared to the of that imply that typing is undesirable. Uh, so, yeah. So, um, maybe the microphone. Yeah, I can't really hear where it's uh, working all the time. You said that the expressive power was comparable to a system F sub, so I wondered whether that would imply that the subtyping relationship is undecidable. So when I said that it's comparable to F sub, I mean more on the lines of the uh, the bounded uh, polymorphic parametric polymorphism. Um, so could you maybe elaborate on the, um, why you think it would be undecidable with respect to our system? Well, because that's an F sub uh, property. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Um, well, then. Yeah, I'll take it offline. So, a slightly related type system question. So, let's say you make a collection of elements which have some kind of mode. But you're saying that the mode has changed. Yes. So, now you have a collection which claims that it has a specific type. Uh, do you provide a way to you know, snapshot something more complex than an object, because snapshot a collection now, and would then require snapshotting every element inside? So in our case studies, we didn't find any examples where we need to do something like that. So typically, if you, um, the collection itself could be the one that's dynamic, and that's the one you would want to snapshot, whereas the individual uh, con components don't necessarily categorize as energy behavior. So you mentioned uh, battery and temperature as things that you're interested in checking. Do you think this would be useful for uh, other dynamic properties like connection quality? Um, I just couldn't hear the last thing you said. Uh, connection quality. Yeah, I think you could use it for that reason as well, yeah. Uh, so I, I thought you were like, different modes are really cool. Um, have you considered uh, like expanding the spectrum to allow like more than two modes? And, yeah. Like, yeah, and, I mean, I'm sure that would be difficult, but do you think the benefits would be really No, so actually the modes are programmer defined. Okay, um, okay. So all they have to do is form a lattice, but the programmer can actually define any number of modes. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you.